I, uh, I came up to the pulpit a little early. I was so excited about being here. No, really, I wanted to catch my breath before I started. I just wanted to, I'm checking to see if my Fitbit collected the steps coming up here. Anyway, it's a great joy to be here. Uh, we'll get to know each other better through the ensuing weeks. Um, and uh, until that precious day when your pastor is called. What we do here, we do in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm going to be doing this for a while, and I'm going to insist that you do one thing for me. All right? Here it is. In my tradition, when I give that versicle, then I'll say amen, and you get to say amen. Okay? That, that means you're, you're kind of with me. You're going to go, are we ready? Okay. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Oh, now I can start. Yeah. Good. Thank you so much. Now, contrary to popular opinion, Jeremiah was not a bullfrog. Now, how many of you know that of which I speak? Come on. Yeah. You do know that of which I speak. Uh, most folks do know about Jeremiah, the prophet of 7th century, but most of them know more about uh, Hoyt Axton's song, who wrote those words, and then um, Three Dog Night that sang them. We know the words to this thing which is called Joy to the World. Not the Christmas carol, but the one that goes, Jeremiah was a bullfrog and he was a good friend of mine. How many of you think you could sing that? I bet you could. We won't try it. And, but then in the chorus, it goes, singing joy to the world, to all the boys and girls. Joy to the fishes in the deep blue sea. Joy to... Yeah, see, you guys know these songs better than you know scripture. Yeah. <laughs> what can I say? Well, I am a sometime guitar player, and I like to lead group singing. And one time I went down to Glenn's Music to pick up a Christmas carol that book that might have better guitar chords for me, And because I, as I led Christmas carols, and sure enough, right there, there was a carol book that had joy to the world. And it did include the one from Isaac Watts and George Frederick Handel, the one we sing at Christmas, but to be sure, there it was. Jeremiah was a bullfrog. Oh, we probably know its words. We know the old one, when heaven and nature sing, repeat the sounding joy. We know that. But what about the real Jeremiah? Will the real Jeremiah stand up? That's an old line. The seventh century prophet from our Old Testament text today. Jeremiah was from the small town of Anathoth outside of Jerusalem. He really did not want to be a prophet, to be a nave. There was a tradition of prophets, prophets like Amos and Hosea and Micah, I, and, and it did not go well for them. The poll numbers were not good. Leslie even calls Jeremiah the reluctant prophet. In Jeremiah, the first chapter, we see him trying to get out of the job that Je the Lord God has for him, but God will not hear of it. And so Jeremiah almost feels trapped, but yet he did his work. Now let's set the, the historical situation. The Assyrians had already taken the northern kingdom, Israel, and Judah, the southern kingdom, where Jeremiah lived, was already a vassal state of Assyria. But Assyria had overextended itself. And the word was that there was a new enemy out there, and they were the Babylonians. Jeremiah warns the people of Judah and its leaders. He says, watch out. And like most prophets, he was not received well. Kings usually do not like to hear something like that. 
So Jeremiah spends time as an outcast, a prisoner, even thrown into a cistern. And later it was in 587 BC that the Babylonians absolutely destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, and took the leadership of Judah into exile into Babylon. Jeremiah somehow escapes that. He doesn't make the trip. And so he stays in the ruined city of Jerusalem. But meanwhile, back in Babylon, the Judeans are under house arrest and they are having a very hard time of it. Their life had been centered around Jerusalem, the temple, and their captors, the Babylonians, tormented them, mocking them, taunting them. Hey, Judeans, sing us the songs of Zion. They refused to do so, and they hung up their harps. But here's what's so unusual about that. I don't know what the mail systems were like between Babylon and the ruined city of Jerusalem, but somehow he gets word and he writes them and he says, now this is not, this is only a paraphrase. You can read it for yourself. Come on, get with it. Keep your faith. Adjust to your situation. Keep your family intact. Pray for your captors. What? Pray for your captors. God will be with you. And it sounds crazy, but that's what they did. You know, that time when the people of Judah were in a exile in the middle of the exile they picked up their situation and developed an unprecedented creative energy that had the following results you do not need to take notes but here they come number one they did the final editing of the Pentateuch the five books of the Torah Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They kind of did a little more editing a little later on Deuteronomy, but that's what they did in exile. Two, they worked on Hebrew history. And so the books of Samuel and of Kings, that's when they got created. They remembered. They had, they had other manuscripts, but they, but they began to put them together. They compiled, number three, they compiled the works of the earlier written prophets like Amos. Number four, they set in stone the observance of the Sabbath. It had been kind of hanging around, but now it was vital to their faith. Totally unique to Judaism. And one last little known fact, they birthed the synagogue. You find no reference to the synagogue before the exile, but while they are separated from temple, here they start these learning centers right there in the middle of Babylon. Although the temple priesthood was important, so soon was to be the role of rabbi, of teacher. Not bad for a few decades work while you're under house arrest. And another point is not only were the Judeans deported into Babylon, but there are others who flew fled to Egypt and went here and there and the diaspora had begun. Now why this history lesson? Because it informs us that as a Christian people what we ought to understand is that we can live in the midst of exile. It was the reformer Martin Luther who first helped us understand that we can be in exile even though we're not deported. He called it the Babylonian captivity, but what he was talking about at that time was the enslavement of the church to the Roman church. There can be exile whether or not we've been deported. Whenever we seem to have lost our way, I would suggest that we are in exile and we need simply to remember who we are and whose we are. We cannot control what is happening to us, Especially, we cannot control what is happening to us in the international and national scene, but we can be active politically and socially and must do so. We must be a people who, like the prophets, seek the truth, tell the truth, 
struggle for justice, respond in mercy. But our efforts frequently fall on deaf ears and unresponsive leaders. But we can control what is happening in our attitude and our understanding, and we can listen to the prophets. There are other ways of being in exile. The exile of losing a job or of retirement. The failure of a marriage. The exile. The, the, the wilderness that you face when the report from your physician has not been good. The prognosis is not good the exile of an estranged relationship with your son or your mother, the other desolation of poverty or dislocation. There is another exile, the exile that is the wilderness, now I'm coming home, of the mainline Protestant church. Friends, the numbers are not good. Get this report just out this week. Fully 26% of the American people contain, can, uh, speak of no religious faith. None. None. The numbers are probably higher because some folks would not admit to a pollster that they have no faith. The numbers of the Presbyterians and Methodists, two former backbones of American Protestantism, continue to bleed membership and worship attendance. Just in case some of you want to read it, a full Pew Research report came out this week. It's got all kinds of wonderful graphs and all kinds of things, even in color, and the news is not good. So we just sit around then and, and, and do we pray? How can I sing the song of the Lord in a strange land? Well, my friends, God is with us. The good news is that God is always working with us even when we are in exile, even when we think there's little hope, even when we shake our head at what's happening in our personal world or in the world around us. Jeremiah tells us that God is setting a new covenant with us, a new promise, a promise that God will keep. God is our ally. He will not forsake us. He will not betray us. Again, hear these words from Jeremiah. They're on the front of your bulletin. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it upon their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Well, so how does this work? Perhaps there are many answers to how God's love can be written on our hearts. But I have one answer that will work in a time of exile and that is while we're in exile, learn the faith. Keep the faith. The passage from 2 Timothy that Paul read to us, it says this, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. In other words, we need to equip ourselves. So if you don't know what to do in these times, become your own rabbi. Steep yourselves in the scriptures. Now, mind you, scriptures don't speak with one voice. I like the way that Jason Biasi puts it. He says, the voice of God's written word comes not of that of a monotone speaker, but rather resembles a raucous family argument stretched out over centuries. Isn't that a good line? The Bible is not a single book, but a library of many, 66 to be accurate, with different authors and settings. Some parts disagree with other parts. And this suggests that God wants us to discern truth through many different voices. So I have a suggestion. I know you thought you were through with homework, but here it comes.
I'd like for you to become familiar with the prophet Jeremiah. So read the prophet. It's in this book. I don't care what translation, but read the prophet Jeremiah. Do it over the next two or three weeks. You'll get to know him, know what he was about. And then read the Gospel of Luke. We'll be dealing some with the Gospel of Luke these next few weeks. Read it. Get to know Jesus even more. Jesus was always in exile. The religious leaders of his time did not dismiss him as just some crazy Galilean fanatic. The religious leaders were frightened of him because he told the truth. The people of the street, however, the people he met with day in and day out, they were fascinated by him because he cared for them when no one else did. The political leaders, they wondered about him. Who was this strange man? He seemed to march to a different drummer, and it made everyone from Pilate to Herod uneasy to say the least, and ultimately they brought about his death. But the people at the cross knew that his love for them was undying, and the new covenant was written upon their hearts, and it became eternal, eternal in the resurrection. Now, let me see if I can give you an example of what it means when you really get steeped into this. One of my personal theological issues has been the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Because of the abuses that I experienced in revival meetings growing up, Methodists did that more than Presbyterians did. But anyway, I really wasn't sure about the Holy Ghost. I remember Don McLean's song, American Pie. Any of you remember that song? Yeah, there are a few. It's a long, long song. But he, he sings this towards the end. He says, And the three men that I admire most, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, they caught the last train for the coast the day that music died. Well, the Holy Spirit was at least on the way to the coast when I joined a covenant discipleship group, which I was, I was a pastor in Derby. Our group met every week, just seven of us, and held each other accountable. We, we would talk with each other and, 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 and ask things, how's things with your soul? And one of the questions we asked was this, have you followed the promptings of the Holy Spirit to love God and your neighbor? Every week, same question. Have you followed the promptings of the Holy Spirit to love God and your neighbor? Yeah. Little by little, I would begin looking for the presence of the Holy Spirit. And I would see it. There it is in the face of that child. There it is telling me to go see my friend John. There it is reminding me to shut up and listen. It was the discipline, a good word for Presbyterians, the continued activity that begins to reach into the marrow of your bones that writes it on your heart. Now, here's a sidebar. This was not written when I finished this sermon on Thursday. Earlier that day, Sarah Diamond had emailed me that I might want to visit with Ivan Tompkins, Tompkins in Bramley House at Meadowlark and Dorothy. I was sitting in my chair Friday afternoon when it occurred to me that I should make that visit. Oh, I'll wait until Saturday morning before the game. Any of you ever do that? Say, I've oh, got the prompting came loud and clear. It said, go now. So, living in Metal Ark wasn't hard. Just walk down to Bramley's house, go into Ivan's room, and learn that Dorothy had died Friday morning. You know her, most of you do. And five minutes later, both Ivan and Dorothy's daughters, both of the girls, arrive in the room. There is no way I could have seen them 
if I had not followed the promptings of the Holy Spirit. We were able to plan and we were able to pray together as family and pastor. That's why it's imperative as a Christian people to continue to remind us of our faith rooted in scripture, consistent with our tradition, reasoned out with our minds and experience in our daily work. We listen to the promptings. We keep the covenant. In fact, I've read your Presbyterian USA website and it says to be a Presbyterian, you live, and I quote, a covenant life marked by a disciplined concern for order in the church according to the word of God. Well, does that say it? Check it out. One more thing about covenant. I don't know, I have any idea what time it is. It doesn't make any difference anyway, you know. But here's what I have to say to you. You here at the First Presbyterian are about to make a new covenant. You have gone through a process to call a new pastor to this congregation. There will be a new covenant with this pastor. Your new pastor will be coming to a strong, vibrant congregation that has the courage to live in the midst of exile, standing for values that seem to be in short supply. And you have a chance to make a new covenant. I can't wait to hear about it. What I dream is I can hear around the edges and maybe even more explicitly than that, somebody saying, well, what's going on at First Press? Well, I can't go anywhere without some Presbyterian telling me about what their church is up to. And they'll say, have you met our new pastor? Do you understand what I'm getting at? Your covenant with this new one. You see, we can live in exile. We hold people accountable to the new covenant. That's what prophets do. We work to bring justice. That's what prophets do. We work to show the everlasting work of God and the love of God. It's a new covenant. It is written on our hearts. And God will be our God. And we will be God's people. Amen.